supposed to have a belief system that is rooted in love, then what exactly does that look like? Right? Because I'm telling you not to have a, a fear-based belief system, but to have a love-based belief system. So what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean? So we're going to get into that today, but I want to uh, just very quickly cover a couple of the uh, highlights of things that we've talked about over the last handful of weeks. Um, and first of all, that it is important that uh, we deconstruct wrong beliefs in our lives, uh, but it's equally important that we reconstruct the right ones, all right? And we talked about the, in, in Scripture, there was a, a, Jeremiah was told to, I'm giving you an assignment, and that assignment is to tear down, but also to rebuild, so it's important that the things that we have uh, held on to and the things that we have espoused that are wrong, that we let those come down. It's important that they come down. But it's also very important that we rebuild the right things because if we're not, if we don't rebuild the right things, then basically we're just left in a pile of confusion where we say, okay, I know that this belief structure was wrong, so I don't believe that anymore. And so now it gets torn down in ruins, but what goes back up in its place? If there's nothing that goes in its place, then essentially you are left with ruins and confusion. That's it. So it's important that you rediscover and redefine what that belief system looks like. And we talked about a lot of things. We talked about um, giving. I, won't, I don't even know what they all are anymore. I'd have to go back and look through my notes. But we talked about giving. We talked about what we do with prayer. We talked about what we do with church attendance. Because we talked about what we do with prayer lines. When, when people are praying for you. And you're like, okay, well, I've seen a lot of weird stuff. Okay, but that doesn't mean that all of it is worthless. And that doesn't mean that all of it's wrong. There's actually probably a good part somewhere in the middle, but a bunch of silly stuff that got connected to it somewhere along the way, right? And so the, the key of all of that is, is to find the good and then remove the silliness or remove the bad. That's part of the deconstruction and the reconstruction that I'm talking about. Um... And we also talked about that fear and love never occupy the same space at the same time. The opposite of fear is not faith. And for those of us who grew up in like a word of faith background, that's right next to blasphemy. That's, that's my version of a joke right now. Yeah. But anyways, this word of faith background, like, no, the opposite of fear is faith in the devil and faith is faith in God. I can't, that's nowhere in scripture. That just sounds nice, but it's not true. The opposite of fear is love. In 1 John 4, it tells us that perfect love casts out or removes or displaces fear. Yep. Those two things do not occupy the same space at the same time. So when you have a belief system that is grounded in fear, what that does is actually prevents the love of God from really penetrating that part and changing that part in your life. Why? Because we have this thing called cognitive dissonance, and we don't like anybody to change our mind. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's a fun one. But you're convinced of something. You know for a fact that it was this way. And then somebody comes to you and says, no, 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 that's not how it was. It wasn't like that. And you're like, oh, yes, it was. I remember it that way. Right? You ever done those things online? It's like the spelling of your childhood toys. Or like, was it Captain Crunch? Was Captain spelled out? Or was it C-A-P-N? Do you remember? See, and people remember that differently. How about the Berenstein Bears? How was that spelled? Everybody thinks it was spelled one way, but it was actually spelled the other way. It's cognitive dissonance. You get convinced that something exists in the way that you want it to exist. And then something comes and shows you otherwise, and you're like, nope, nope, that's not how it was. I know that's not how it was, but the proof is staring you in the face, and we just don't like to change our minds. So, all that being said is that when you have a belief system that you've held on to for your, li your whole life in some cases, and then someone comes to you and says, hey, it's not actually like you've always thought. It's different. We have to fight the first reaction being, no, it's not. I know better than that. I remember when I was a kid, my grandma told me, okay, but I've got, let me consider this. No, nope, no, nope, that's not. See how, okay, maybe you're not quite that way, but we as people tend to be, right? We don't really like to be told that we're wrong. We don't really like to be proven like, you know what, maybe all these years that wasn't actually accurate. We don't like that. We don't like the feeling 
that, you know what, I have to look at myself and change something. We don't, we don't like that. So here's what I'm getting at is what I want you to know is that the fear-based systems that we've held on to, they truly are worthless and they are what uh, the Apostle Paul would refer to as a stronghold or a stumbling block that would cause when someone brings you the truth, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, I can't get over that. I don't know about that. I, I'm not sure I'm going to buy into this. This whole God is love stuff, like I know he's love, but he's also wrath. But can you show me a scripture for that? Because I can't. I can show you a scripture that says God is love and God is light. I can show you scripture. That's another thing we talked about. We actually talked about is God wrath. I actually looked at the meaning of that word wrath. It's actually passion. So a lot of times when we looked at it and say God's wrath is on them, actually his passion was for them. His desire was for them. I'm not going to re-preach uh, re all of this, but I want to lay a, bit of, a little bit of groundwork again before we keep moving on. So again, the places in your life where you have believed that you have to do something or you better do something or you better not do something because there's some kind of consequence tied to it, a lot of times we don't like to give that up because it's comfortable. We like to hold on to that because that's what I've always known. That's what I've always believed. So when I'm talking about if we're going to reconstruct in love, what exactly does that look like? Well, let me, uh, let me ask, just start off by asking a couple questions, and let's kind of see where this, where this takes us. Um, let me start off with this. Are there any expectations that go along with love? So let me ask, let me ask it this way. Husband and wife, um, whether or children, parent, whatever relationship that you can think of that is a love relationship in your life where you say, I love this person with all of my heart. Are there any expectations that go with that love? Or is it just kind of, oh, do whatever you want? No. Yeah, it's a lot more. There are expectations that go with this love, right? Um, I think my wife fully expects that after, uh, if I'm gone, that I come back home. That is a rightful expectation that she can have of me right? She also can have the expectation that when she calls, I will answer the phone. Those are, I think those are fair expectations. We could go a lot further and we could go a lot more. Um, I, can, I can expect certain things of her. She can expect certain things of me. If the kids need attention, it's fair of her to expect that I will do something about it and vice versa, right? Does that make sense? Just some simple just some simple stuff, that love comes with expectations and that's in, in every single case, love brings expectations, but those expectations can go too far, but there are right expectations that go with love. So here's the problem that I think that we've actually run into is oftentimes when you start to understand that God is love and that God is grace and that God is mercy and that God is peace, we internalize that as saying, oh, well, if that's the case, then I can do whatever I want. Okay, I know for a fact that my wife loves me with all of her heart. Does that give me as a right, or give me as a husband, the right to do whatever I want? So I just kind of hopefully destroyed one of your little belief systems that was trying to build itself up right there. See, I, I know that she loves me with all of my heart. I know that God loves me with everything that is within him. And so we say, oh, it doesn't matter if I do this. It doesn't matter if I do that. Really, ask my wife if it matters to her what I do. Y'all are quiet already. This is great. So ask my wife if it matters. Why does it matter? Because everything that I do with her and for her and for our family communicates something to her. Okay, it communicates how important she is, how important our home is, how important our family is. Yep. It's Right? Does that make sense? Yep. Everything I do communicates something yeah. to her. True. The same thing is true with God. If we get into a place where God is love, and so it doesn't matter if I do this, and it doesn't matter if I do that. Wait, wait, wait. Everything you do communicates something. I'm not saying that she would stop loving me if I go through a hard time. I'm not saying that God's going to stop loving me if I go through a hard time. Right, does this make sense? We can understand, I, I hope, where I'm coming from. But everything that I do matters. And there are expectations of hers that need to be met that are rightful expectations out of love. Right? And so, 
Let me ask you this. Is it, uh, is it a rightful expectation for children to expect that their parents care for them? Yes. yes. That is a rightful expectation. Yep. Whether or not that happens is a different story, but that is a rightful expectation. As a child of God, you can have the expectation that your father will take care of you. And that's a really good spot for an amen. You have the right to expect that your father will take care of you, that he'll love you, that he'll be there for you, that he'll have your back. You can have the expectation that that will happen. Right? In a marriage situation, you can have the expectation, and it's a rightful expectation, that love is going in both ways, that you are serving each other and giving to one another, and you have a healthy expectation in that way. But I want you to understand that expectations are tied to love. They always have been, always will be. And so when we get up, and if I'm preaching something, or pastor's preaching something, Pastor Cindy, whoever's preaching and teaching and saying, we're talking about, you name it, about being here to help and bless people, or giving, or we need help with something, or we need to be praying for someone, the fact of what you do with that information communicates something yeah. both to God and to the people around you. Right. Right. Okay, this is where it might get a little, a little heavy. I'm not necessarily trying to, but hey, I want you to understand what we're getting at. Because if, if, I, if I stand up here and say, guys, we need to pray for whoever, and you're like, yeah, okay, and not once did you ever do it or ever think about it, that does communicate something to where you're at in your maturity, in your love, and in your spiritual life. It does communicate something. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not saying we get to sit back and go, oh, Ty didn't pray. She's immature. She's horrible. She's this. That's not the point. But what I'm saying is we tell on ourselves all the time. Yeah. And don't think that God doesn't see it. And not that he's angry with you, but... He sees those places, and what will he do? He'll bring somebody like me who is maybe annoying and brash and try to pull that out of you, right? There's a little burr on the side of you, and so this crazy preacher with a fireworks shirt is going to try to get your attention and rub you the wrong way and say something that's going to annoy you and go, hey, wait a minute, I didn't even think about that. Maybe I need to reconsider what I'm doing, right? right? The whole reason why we even when we come to church, I love the worship. We can just stay there. It is so good. But the reason why we take time even to stop and teach is because we need this from one another. Uh, I, I never skid up in this pulpit and, and before service tell my wife, like, I don't even care what I'm going to preach about. I'll figure out something. It's always something that's, that God has put on my heart. It's, and I, I'm not speaking just for myself. I know that's how we are. It's, God, where do you want to take us? Where is it that you want to bring us as a family? Where do you want to take us as a ministry? Where is your heart right now? And that's where this comes out of. So when I'm up here, I'm not just trying to pick on things that I don't like or see, uh, address issues I don't like. To be totally honest, there's a bunch of stuff in my life that when I look at this and when I preach this, like, you know what, I should do better at that. No different than anybody else. Yeah. Truth of the matter is that there are expectations that come with love. So when we talk about reconstructing in love, I want to, pull, want to go to the scripture, uh, Seth, if you will, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9. And so when I've been talking about reconstructing in love, I think it would be helpful to see where, uh, like look at times where love was manifested and where we can see that love took an action of some kind, yeah. and then see what that looks like, right? So 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 9, it says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Next verse. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. Stop there for a minute. Jump back to verse 9, if you will, though. So let's look at a time and a place where love was manifested, where something happened uh, that was purely driven by love. Okay? According to Scripture, in this, the love of God was made manifest. So the next thing that is about to be said is the thing that was birthed purely out of God's love for us, yeah. okay? So when we look at this, the very next statement that's about to be made is one that you and I can look at and say, okay, 
when love is sincere, it will kind of, not, maybe not all the time, but it will look like this. This is the one of the ways it can look like. Well, what, what happened? That God sent his only begotten son into the world. So, God's love was made manifest in his willingness to give. Now, before you, uh, before you get all excited, I'm not preaching about giving today, necessarily. But, an honest and sincere and mature love is always, 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 underline that word, it's always ready and willing to give. Now, maybe you have enough to, to give to solve a problem, maybe you don't, but love always chooses to give. I'm helping you with your marriage right now, too, if you didn't know it. Love always chooses to give. Because God had such an intense love for us, for humans, that he said, you know, for all of these years, in all of this time, I've been misrepresented. I've had these people, these religious people, who say that the pinnacle of perfection is their holiness and the robes they wear and the prayers that they pray. That's not who I am. That's never who I wanted to be. I've got these people that are doing these blood sacrifices. I never even wanted blood sacrifices. Here's what I've got to do. I'm going to send my son because I need them to stop seeing all of the other silliness. I need them to see my heart. So he gave something that was so meaningful that literally changed the, skip, the entire course of the world. But you have to understand that a, a, a belief system that is based in love is always one of giving. Let, let me just give you this. If this was you and you were had to make this decision to send your son into the situation or your daughter into the situation that you knew Jesus was walking into, can you think of another situation that would be or could potentially cause more fear because of all the things that Jesus was going to have to go through? As a parent, how would you like it to know that your child was about to be ridiculed and mocked and a crown of thorns and his beard pulled out of his face and lashed with a whip and carry a cross and hung to a cross. Wouldn't that get you a little bit anxious as a parent? But see, love sees through the sacrifice to the other side and knows at the other side this is going to show and prove and display how much that I actually love and how much I care. And even if it's hard along the way, it's okay. I'm willing to be inconvenienced because my love is that it matters that much. My love matters enough to take a weekend off or a weeknight off and go help and do something for someone else. My love matters enough that when I say that I'm actually going to pray for you that I actually do it. Right? So my love matters enough that when you need something, I'll do anything and everything I can do to help. I may not be able to fix it, but I'll do anything and everything I can do to help. Does that make sense? That's kind of what a love-based belief system will do. Yeah. How about this? John 3.16. I think everybody knows this verse. But God so loved that he did what? He gave. Right. So a love, if, if we're going to look at anybody and say, okay, this is the epitome, this is the, the model that we should follow, I think Jesus would be the right one. I think he'd be the one to look at him and say, okay, the things that drove you are the things that should drive me, right? And he went through all kinds of stuff. And if we get a little ridiculed, we think it's the end of the world. But you know what? We'll, we'll get past that. You know what? We're, we're tough. We're strong Christians. We're soldiers in the army of God. We can take this. We got the armor on, right? Are you kidding me? Look, love will give till it hurts. And I'm not talking about money, by the way, guys. I'm, I, I'm not just talking about money. I'm saying that love will give your time. Parents, you ever had to give a little bit more than you wanted to give to your kids? Because in the middle of the night, they were screaming. Or in the middle of the night, they weren't feeling well. Or they fought the monkey, arms, monkey bars and broke their arm. And you had to totally change your schedule. How inconvenient is that? I had a nice day at the beach planned, and all of a sudden, my kid decides to throw up. Oh my gosh, child. We were on vacation down in Tennessee and uh, we're having a wonderful day and Lincoln was, he ever, every so often he gets like this, but he's like not eating and not very hungry 
and we're walking down Gatlinburg, and if you've been in Gatlinburg, that's not a real great place to be sick because there's only about 97 million people in this like few square blocks. So it's not a real convenient place to be sick, and all of a sudden, he gets this look on his face, and he's like, bleh, on the sidewalk, right? We're like, okay, so we had this whole day planned. We were going to go to the aquarium. We were going to do this, and I was like, guess what we're not doing now? Any of that stuff that we just planned on doing, right? You ever been there? But what does, look, when that's your kid, you don't even think twice about it. It doesn't even cross your mind to be like, oh, tough it out, kid. I don't care. You're going to make it. Or go sit in the car. You can wait until we're all done. It's, yeah, it's kind of not, that's not necessarily a good thing, especially when they're like four or five, you know, doing this. Okay, maybe if they're 17 or something. No, I'm kidding. But when they're like five, whatever he was, like that's not a good way to handle it, right? So in the middle, all of our plans had to change. How amazingly inconvenient is that? Guys, don't you think that in the, that is what love does? That love, even though in its inconvenience, never stops. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's inconvenient for me to do something, or it's inconvenient for me at times, really love should require that I do respond somehow. Again, I might not be able to fix it, but surely I can do something, right? Surely I can pray and I can ask God, like, okay, give me a word for it. Give me a word for him. Uh, you know, if I've got a $5 bill in my wallet, that's all I've got, but I, you know what? Here, it's what I have. See, when Jesus said, the way that you're going to know that you're my disciples is by your love one for another, what do you think that actually meant? I mean, how do you prove to somebody on a continual basis that you love them? Well, we've, we've learned over the course of time, there really are five different ways that you can do that. It's quality time, it's touch, it's giving, right? It's the five love languages. You can show love in a lot of different ways. So I'm not telling you when I say giving, I'm not saying I'm necessarily giving money. I'm saying sometimes it's a matter of calling somebody up and be like, hey, let's go hang out for a while. You don't know what that means to somebody sometimes. I don't, maybe you're the coffee drinker, maybe you're not. Like, don't ask me out for coffee because I'm not going. (laughs) I'm not a coffee drinker, right? But at the same time, that doesn't mean there aren't other things that I'd be more than happy to do, right? It It doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that you can show people love. So what I'm saying is being attentive to the Holy Spirit of what I can do and how I can do and making sure that somehow I'm communicating to the people around me that I love you, that Father loves you. Guys, that's what a love based belief system will drive you to do. It'll drive you to do things that are for the sake of other people, even though it inconveniences you. I would say it this way, that as your love increases, your desire to give should increase. Because I can say, and I can say with all confidence, that the Father loves really hard. He loves with an intense love. And He gave or in a really big way to show it. And as your love increases, so should your desire to give. I want to talk about this for a minute. <clears throat> Oftentimes when I, hear about, um, when I hear about love, I always hear people say, essentially, that, oh, that love is patient, love is kind, but love is also my willingness to get in your face. Okay, that's kind of true. I think it's funny that we have to always make sure that we say that. Um, you know, we got we to gotta make sure that I can still be a jerk to you every so often, right? That's kind of how it sounds. So, but this is the thing. I think it's an immature view of love that says that love doesn't confront because love does confront. Parents, you ever confronted your children? Does it mean you don't love them? No, the opposite is true. You confront something because you do love them, right? So, But love doesn't confront for the sake of the confrontation or to prove who's right or wrong. So for me to get up and say, oh, love is patient, love is kind, but love also lets me get in your face. Okay, but what's my motivation for getting in your face? I think that's, now we're talking about, is that really love or is that just my pride that got hurt and now I need to prove to you that I'm right? Well, anyways, so... Love doesn't confront for the sake of confrontation, but it will confront the problem with a solution. 
and I hope that you I hope that you're hearing me. Love will confront with a solution. Think about this, of all of the times that Jesus was out living life and doing things and something was brought to his attention or the crowd came and the Bible says he was moved with compassion, what's the next thing he did? Something. He did something. He didn't go, oh, these poor people. They're like people, like a sheep without a shepherd. Okay, see you guys. Got an appointment I'm going to make it to now. I'll, I'll see you next time. Okay, so what does love do? It does something. But he, the love always had the solution for it. The disciples came to Jesus and said, all these people are gathered together and they're really hungry. What should we do? He's like, give me something to work with. And he multiplies the bread and fish and he feeds everybody. See, love has a solution. And I think, guys, this is, if I'm going to address the church as a whole for a minute, let me do that. I think the modern church right now is so caught up in loving people that we've forgotten that we've got the solution. It's exactly what Pastor Cindy was talking about earlier. People who live and walk in a place of torment and anxiety, have we forgotten that we have the Prince of Peace living in us? Let, let, me, let me touch on this one for a minute. And this, again, I'm not trying to just pick on stuff. But the Bible says that those people who are given over to sexual impurity will not receive the kingdom in, their life, in this life. They don't experience righteousness, peace, and joy. So people who are caught in sexual sin of whatever you want to name it, have we forgotten that we actually have the solution for that? Have we forgotten that the Jesus and the Holy Spirit in you is big enough to overcome that? Have we forgotten that the answer to what you need is in you? It is found in Him. See, I think we're so busy about loving people that we forgot to love them and give them a solution. See, it's, not, it's, it's one thing if my kid is going through something, it's like, oh, you poor thing, you got your hands caught in the door. It's still caught in the door. And I have the ability to open the door and let your finger out of there, but instead I'm just, I love you so much, open the door. <laughs> have we forgotten that that's what it's like for people, that they get stuck in their sin, they don't know what to do, they live in depression, instead we call it a disease, not realizing we've got the answer. Uh -huh. So we're not loving them, that's, a, that's nonsense. We're just tolerating people. Because if we actually loved them, we'd give them something. We'd give them a solution. Is this coming out a little hard? See, it bothers me when Christians stand back and say, uh, you know, when, they're, when they just step back and say, I'm okay with sin. It's okay if you're dealing with sin. No, it's not. It's not okay because it puts you in bondage. Right? The book of Galatians talks about flesh bondage, they go together. Like sin, flesh, and bondage, those three things get grouped together. But freedom, life, and the Holy Spirit, those things go together. So when we see people in bondage and we just want to stroke them and say, I love you, everything's going to be fine, that's not true. And that's fake love. It's kind of like fake news. That is not sincere love. Because sincere love, actually when my kid's hand is shut in the car door, will open the door so they can get their hand out and there can be some relief. I think we've forgotten that we have the answer in us. And we're so intent and content to just stand back and go, I love people. It's okay if they're dealing with this stuff. Look, it's okay that they're dealing with it, but what are we doing about it? I'm not saying, you've got to understand me, and I think everybody in this room, you know me. I am not saying that you go to somebody who's caught in sin and go, you have to change. That's not what I'm saying. Jesus never did that. But the Holy Spirit always knew exactly what to do, what button to push to set them free. When's the last time that we ever did that? See, we don't look at love being that way. We look at love as being passive and don't confront because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Is this, uh, is this making sense? See, I'm, I'm not telling you that you need to go fix everybody's everything. That's a matter of fact, one of the earlier messages that I preached on this is it's not your responsibility to change anybody's anything. 
It's not your responsibility to make anyone do anything. You are in charge of who? You. Right? But that doesn't mean that you can't present a solution to somebody who really, really needs it. Right? Think back to the times that you were in school and you're just stuck on this problem. You just don't know what to do. And you go to the teacher and you're like, I need help with this. And then you had the really horrible teachers who were like, well, I talked about that in class last week. You weren't paying attention. You're like, thanks a lot for all of the help, right? But then you also had that amazing teacher that was like, yeah, okay, so you take this and you start here and you do this, right? One, on one hand, you've got the person giving you the lip service, like, well, I already told you what to do, so you need to just go fix it. And in the meantime, I'll be here to support you. Thank you very much for that. On the other hand, you have the teacher that says, you know, we may have already been through this, but let me walk you through it again. See, on one hand, you get a solution. On the other, on the other hand, what is it? Certainly not helpful. Does this make sense? That love is something that drives you to give something. When we look at the Father and when we look at Jesus, we can say that their love drove them to give. And what I think we've actually been peddling in the church modern day is a cheap version of love that just embraces everybody's everything, even if you're a total disaster and in bondage. It's okay because we love you so much. The fact that I love you knows it doesn't change. Like, that's not up for debate. How much I love you, okay, now we need to actually talk about this because I can say, oh, I love, I love Bob. He's a great guy. Okay, but what if Bob actually is in bondage to something and instead of me just going, oh, that's just Bob, me actually praying for him, Holy Spirit, what can I do? What can I give to actually help him to set him free, to show him that you're different than he's always thought? Right? What, what about the person who is actually trapped in a lifestyle of sin? And they, they don't know what to do, and they don't know how to get out. And so instead, they're angry about it. I actually had a lady, this was years ago, I worked with a lady who came up to me one day, and she's like, I got something to tell you. I was like, okay, what's that? She's like, I'm a lesbian. And I was like, I know. And she's like, what do you mean you know? I was like, it's not like you're trying to hide it or anything. And uh, she's like, well, you're a Christian, right? You probably don't think that's right. And I was like, what did, wait, who told you that that's what I said or that's what I think? I never told you that. We've never had this conversation before. Why are you angry with me? Like she was like very aggressive towards me about it. But see, that's how sin comes out. They know they're in bondage. They know that's not where they want to be, that's, they're, that they're stuck in a spot. They're crying out for some sort of deliverance, have no idea, what, they're just angry. Ever, ever seen a, an animal that's trapped, like a, a bear or something that's trapped, and you, or a deer, and you go to help them? What's the first thing they do? Try to kill you. Right? Like they're, the first, they're, They'll be thrashing and flailing and all kinds of stuff, because like, this guy's coming to kill me, when the whole time you're like, I'm just trying to open the trap, I want to help you, Right? Guys, I'm telling you, that's what sin does. That's what bondage does. It brings people to a place they don't feel safe. They know they're in bondage, and the first time they get approached by somebody, the first thing they're going to do is lash out at you because they don't know what to expect. But love, on the other hand, will walk into a situation, be able to diffuse that, and then bring a solution to the problem. Because, see, I think we've forgotten that you, you have the solution on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you knows exactly what to say, exactly what to do, exactly what to present to someone to get through to them. See, I think this is why it's so important that we don't get comfortable just being in a position of learning. Because we can, it's wonderful if you learn. Please learn as much as you can. Learning is a wonderful thing. But for the sake of time, I'm probably going to skip over this. But Paul talks about having both the, the words and the learning, but also a demonstration. And that's why it's so important, is because when we just sit back and learn, then it's easy for us to approach any situation out of our head. It's easy for us to go, oh, I know what's going on here, instead of going, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? That's why both are important. That's why it's important 
that when we're here, we actually practice a little bit. That's what Pastor Cindy was doing earlier, just giving a little a word here and there. That's why that's important. Is because never at any point should we set it down and go, Holy Spirit, you're all well and good, but I know what's going on here. I can help them. Okay, you can try. Holy Spirit's actually an expert at it, so you could let him try too. But this is why it's very important that not only, not only do we learn, but we also demonstrate the power of God at every opportunity that we're given. Having a reconstructed love-based belief system is important, not just so we can know the right things, but that we can do the right things with the right motivation. See, when I, when I think back to kind of where this started for me and understanding that there was a lot of, uh, how do I want to say it? A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of behavior in me that was driven by fear, whether or not it's going to church or giving or praying or whatever. And a lot of those things were motivated by fear, at least to some degree. When I kind of realized that was the case, and I think oftentimes when people realize that's the case, we have a tendency to just kind of, oh, well, all of that goes out the window. We just throw it all out the window, and we kind of forget why it was important. And the reason why it was important is because everything I do communicates something. Right? Does that make sense? Whether or not I'm here communicates something to you guys about me and what I believe about you and what I believe about this ministry. Okay? And again, I'm not trying to... You guys, you know me well enough. What I give in the offering communicates something to you about me. And it communicates something to you about what I believe about this ministry. Now, you don't necessarily know how much we give. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But everything that I do, everything that we do, communicates something to one another. When you walk in the door, and I purposely avoid you the whole time, does that not communicate something to you? When you walk in the door, and I give you a hug, does that not also communicate something to you? Like, does, this, does, that, does this make sense? Uh, what I'm trying to get you to see is that love will drive you to certain behaviors, because that's what love does. Yeah. Right? Love, I want, maybe not every time do I get around to say hi to everybody. Maybe that's not the way that this works. But at the same time, when I have the opportunity to, what do I do with it? Right? Maybe I don't have all the money that I would love to give right now at this moment, but I've got something, what do I do with it? And I'm not, look, I'm saying it can go in the offering. I'm also saying it might need to go in your hand. Uh, The Holy Spirit knows this stuff way better than I do. But it's important that we pay attention to what he's saying. <clears throat> so I would, uh, I was kind of thinking about this. Some of the old terminology, some of the vernacular I grew up with is, you know, one of them was being, being a spirit-led person. And some of that stuff just becomes cliche a little bit after a while. Like you hear it and you hear it and you hear it and you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But truthfully, guys, that really is who we should be. We should be led by the Spirit. We should be able to have a relationship such that if I've got the opportunity to bless you, I'm in a, I'm in a place the Holy Spirit can say, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to give this. I want you to say this. Guys, and I'm going to be the first one to stand up and say, I'm not doing that nearly enough. Not, I mean, not even close to enough. So it's not like I'm saying, you need to do this. I'm saying, collectively, I believe this is the church is kind of missing this in a lot of ways. That we're relying on, I'm going to love you from way over here. You're just my favorite Dan in the world. I don't care that you're in bondage. I don't care that you just broke a bone in your body. I'm not even going to bother to pray for you. But I sure do love you. No, you don't. You've learned to tolerate. But your love doesn't really mean anything unless there's something to it. Right? I mean, I can, I can tell my wife all day long that I love her, but if all the things that I do communicate the opposite, which one is she going to believe? Well, I tell you I love you all the time. Yeah, but you never show me. Right? 
That's legit, guys. <clears throat> I think I'm going to wrap it up with this. Every miracle that God ever does, every miracle that he ever did, was just, this is something I heard Bill Johnson say, every single one of those miracles were just God's way of communicating to you that he loves you. That's really all a miracle is. It's just God's communication of love to you. And that's why sometimes miracles might be physical, they might be emotional, they might be uh, financial, they could be any number of things. But God knows kind of how and where to find you. He knows where you're at and He knows the things that matter to you and He knows how to get the words or the things into your hands. But it does require other people often to be involved with that. That's why... A lot of times when we're preaching, it's not nothing that we're saying is ever to your shame, but it is sometimes to kind of poke you and to spur you. It's like, hey, be mindful of the person next to you. Be mindful of the person across from you. I preached a message years ago that I, I should probably get back out if I can find it, but I actually preached on worship and why oftentimes your worship isn't just for you, but it's for the other person across the room. And oftentimes the things that you do and the things that you say, you might almost be surprised who notices. Isn't, isn't it funny how things will come up and then all of a sudden you're like, I never even realized that I, this person knew that person. And, you know, I, I've had that happen many times. I've told my wife before, I was like, I'm really glad that I was in that situation that I was a decent person because not, I didn't know that that person was related to this person and they knew this or... I, like, I'm really glad I handled that situation well because otherwise, if I would have done what I wanted to do, right? So what I'm saying, but somebody's always watching. You know, Danae taught me this more than anything. From the time she had two ears on her head, she was eavesdropping on every conversation we had. <laughs> it was ridiculous. She, she just little tiny thing, and, you know, it's, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but she only seemed like she was a couple years old, and she'd be like, oh, and repeating something that I said, or bringing up something that she heard at church, or do something. I was like, I didn't even know that this registered with you, and yet here she is, wanting to go on this whole discourse on all this stuff. At two years old, she was ridiculous. But the, the crazy thing about it to me is that taught me, and that reminds me, like, look, somebody's always watching. Yeah. Somebody's always watching. So the days that I decide to step out of love and do something stupid, you know who ultimately that affects? It could be a lot of people. It could be a lot more people than I would even realize sometimes. But every, every miracle that God brings, every word that He speaks, is all communicating something to you, and that something is always going to be that He is for you, that He loves you, that He has the best for you. That's what He's going to do. And if we can reconstruct a belief system that is rooted in love and not fear. I'm not giving because I'm scared. I'm not coming to church because I'm fearful. I'm not loving you because if I don't, God's going to be mad at me. The, the belief systems that are rooted in love will always give, but they will give in such a way that it is my truly my heart's cry that it would bless you beyond what I could ever, ever imagine that it could do. I'm going to end with this story, and I've told it before. But I think it's a good example of God taking a situation and bringing something more out of it than we ever could. And it's when my dad died, the guy who loaned him the motorcycle. I've told this story before. But loaned him the motorcycle um, that he was driving when he got in the accident and when he died. The guy who owned the motorcycle felt incredibly guilty because my dad really hadn't been, rode a uh, road motorcycle much before. And it was his bike, and he felt like he was responsible because he's the one who got my dad on it and all this stuff. So fast-forwarding through all of the events that lead us to the viewing, and my brother and I were standing inside, and somebody came to us and said, hey, this guy is here. And we knew his name. Just, I just knew his name. That's it. I never met him. But I said, hey, this guy is here. And so my brother and I are both like, we probably should go out and talk to him because he wasn't coming in. He was like on the steps, on the front steps, but he wouldn't actually come in the building. And so my brother and I went out. 
And we're like, we should talk to this guy. And as soon as we came out, he apparently knew who we were, but I, again, neither one of us knew who he was. But as soon as we both came out the door, if you've ever seen a grown man sob, that's what this was. I mean, he was crying from the bottoms of his feet, just sobbing, and I'm so sorry, and I'm so sorry. It's, it's my fault. I am so sorry. So my brother on one side and me on the other, we just hugged him. And for a little bit, just kind of let him cry because somebody's crying uncontrollably. You just kind of have to let it go. There's obviously a lot of stuff there. So we're holding him. He finally collects himself a little bit. And I said to him, I said, I, I need you to know, like we need you to know, there's not an, a bone in our body that blames you for any of this. And I, and I truly didn't. But there's not a bone in our body that blames you for any of this. And when I said that, the same emotion came out a second time. And he's just sobbing again. Because all he ever wanted to know was that we would forgive him and that we would love him and not hold him responsible. He told us after, again, my brother and I walk him in, of course, my dad's laying there, and we kind of go through all that. He collects himself towards the end of him being there, and he said, I've been a preacher my whole life, and never until today have I ever understood the love of God. And I've been preaching it for years, and I've never understood it until right now. Because you guys just showed me what it looks like. I can talk about it till my face falls off, but you just showed me what it looks like. And this whole situation completely changed his life. So what I'm saying is you never really know. It's not about how much you know, but it's about how much you love. Because I know it was his motorcycle, and I know that he shouldn't have been riding it, and I know that my dad was getting tired because they'd been on it for hours, and wisdom says that they should have stopped. All of that is true, but it doesn't matter because love trumps all of it. My love for this guy needs to be more important than a motorcycle. Was that inconvenient for me? Yeah, pretty much. That was not a good season of my life. But love has got to trump that stuff. Love has got to be more. It's got to be found in a demonstration. I didn't set out to demonstrate, but all I heard the whole time I was hugging him is that there's not a bone in my body that blames you for any of this. That's, I just heard the Holy Spirit going over and over and over in me. So that's what I said. And that's all I said. And that one phrase, that one sentence changed this guy's life forever. But guys, that's what I'm saying. It's not about learning and being right. It's about what does love say? What does love do right now in this moment? What does love do? And if you don't know the answer to that, I know someone who knows the answer. And he's living in you and you just got to talk to him. The Holy Spirit will, he's so faithful and he's so good. And he will say things to you. Sometimes it's just the simplest little things. You're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this person. I'm so angry right now. Okay, but what does, love has got to win. It's got to win. So and that's probably one of the most sobering stories I have, but it's one of my favorites because it's one of the very few times, or I should say it's one of the most memorable times that I can say in my, some of my deepest pain that God used that to bless somebody else, and I'd never experienced that before. It's super weird. Like, I felt like I should be the one being ministered to right now, and yet in the middle of that, I'm the one doing the ministering. It doesn't even make sense. But that's how the Holy Spirit works sometimes. But that, that helped me. That set me free. Because it, it, it wouldn't, the Holy Spirit would not allow me to hold unforgiveness. It's like, nope, you know what? You're going to say right now that you're letting this whole thing go. You're going to say it with your mouth. You don't always think about this stuff when it happens, but boy, when you look back, you're like, Holy Spirit, thank you so much. 
You're so faithful. So everything that I'm telling you and everything I've been communicating to you today is the fact. We've got to let love win. We've got to let love drive the things that we do. Love can confront, but it's going to do it with a solution. You have the Prince of Peace in you. In the middle of a storm, He's still there. He's still ready. Maybe you're not, but He is. You can present peace. You can present healing. You can do something. And guys, this is where I believe that God's taking us as a ministry and as a body. I truly believe that where God is taking His church as a whole is to a bunch of people that have maybe learned a lot of the right things but are willing to actually go do them. And in the middle of the hardest parts that they face sometimes, that love can still come out. I would love to tell you that that's how every bad situation I've ever been and tough situation, that every single one I've responded with love. That is not the case. (laughs) But there are moments where it happens, and in those moments you're like, I don't think I have felt an anointing like that in the biggest services I've ever been in, in the best prayer lines I've ever been in, the most holy and anointed person who's ever laid their hands on me. Not any of those things hold a candle to what just happened on the front steps. Because that is pure love. But see how you can either let fear run things or you can let love run things. Man, I'm telling you, you've got to let love win. You've got to let love win. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you today for your love. Father, I thank you that in the middle of anything and everything that we may have ever gone through, in the places where maybe we have not responded like we should, thank you, Father, there's no shame. You're just growing us up. You're teaching us. You're helping us. And you're helping us to be able to address and identify and walk out and respond in love. Father, I pray that over the course of this past number of weeks that maybe we've been able to identify places that fear has had a hold on us. Father, I pray that your love would step into that place. And I pray that you would help us to let love win. Father, I pray that our love would be so sincere that it would drive us to give, just like it did you, that your love drove you to action, that Jesus, when you were on this earth, when you saw things, it just drove you to action. Father, help that to be us. Because your word says that you'd always give seed to the sower. So we can't out and we can't outgive you in any way. That as we continue to pour out, as we continue to give out, that the oil just keeps pouring in and keeps pouring in and keeps pouring in. We just keep giving it out. Father, I thank you for your love. Let it become real. Let it become more real than it ever has before. Father, I thank you. We're going to let love win. No more fear, but we're going to let love win. Father, we thank you for it today. Thank you for it today. Kenzie, I just heard the Holy Spirit say that he's going to bring you into a season that he's going to redefine love for you. I don't necessarily know what that means. I mean, I've known you for a lot of years now. Um, It's been a while since I've seen you, so I was happy to see you today. Um, So I don't necessarily know what that means, but I'm going to redefine some things for you. Um, It's going to bring some clarity, maybe on things that are going on. Maybe that's something that you need to do. I don't don't really know, but it's just going to redefine some things for you. It's going to help you. So... um, Father, I just pray for that right now in Jesus' name. I thank you that you're redefining things. 
for her, whatever, whatever that means, whatever it needs to be, that you're redefining her and that in that, in that outpouring of love and in that redefining and reconstruction, Father, I pray that you give her wisdom, uh, maybe on the things that she's going through, things that she's facing. Father, I just pray that you would give her the wisdom to walk through this and to do it in love, whatever it is. Father, I thank you for it. Thank you for it in Jesus' name.